If you've been watching the news recently, you've seen that nations are being overtaken by radical groups. Imagine being a Christian in one of these places and feeling outnumbered or surrounded. We're going to talk about these people today, but in your own life, you have to understand that if you're a difference maker, you're probably not the majority. Many times we're going to feel outnumbered, surrounded, or insignificant, but the kingdom of God inside of us gives us the power and ability to make a difference in the world. Join us today as we talk about how you can be a difference maker in the face of opposition. Welcome to another episode of the AIMS.org podcast, a place for inspiring conversations to ignite passion and a global perspective in difference makers. We invite you to subscribe to this podcast to receive new content as soon as it's released. And now, your host, Joshua Bold. Today, we're so excited to be with you and talk about what you can do when you feel outnumbered or surrounded. The truth is that all of us are called to bring kingdom. And Jesus refers to his life even as a seed. Imagine a seed in the, mat- in the middle of a field that's called to fill that field with grain for harvest. And so being outnumbered is not a new idea in the kingdom of God. In fact, sometimes it's exactly where God places us and who he calls us to be. Someone who can make a big impact even though we're not the the majority. And so today, Bevan, this conversation was sparked because we have friends in um, Afghanistan who are outnumbered. They're just trying to stay alive right now. They're running. They're, we know their kids. We know their their families, and and we love them so dearly, and they're feeling outnumbered. But we also have friends that are in different walks of life and business leaders, and things are happening in the world, and many times people feel like the deck is stacked against them. And so today I want us to encourage our listeners, and I hope as you're listening that you're being encouraged that... <clears throat> It doesn't mean you're out of the will of God just because you're not the majority. In fact, he may have placed you in a situation to be outnumbered or to feel surrounded because he wants that to be a part of his glory story in your life. Yeah. I really hope that this is a ministry podcast episode that we minister to hearts, especially if our Afghan friends are listening. I hope that you're ministered to. And then also... People that are dealing with anxiety, I know in the world today, there's a lot, you're hearing a lot, we're being inundated with so many hard things. And so we're not designed to carry all of that. And that can create a lot of anxiety. And God wants to minister to people feeling anxious, feeling surrounded, feeling outnumbered. And I believe he will today. And the other day, we were talking to one of our friends from Afghanistan, and everybody's heard the news and knows the situation with the Taliban. But it's something when you know a person individually, which we do, and we're talking to one of our friends, and she just said she's very, very scared. She was with her baby, and her husband is in another city, and they're experiencing the Taliban surrounding their home, and they're just – and also these are believers. And so they're feeling very, very scared and outnumbered. She said that her husband is alone, that he just had a bag of rice that he's been eating off of, that he hasn't been able to go out and get food or anything. And so you could hear in her voice just the fear. And I loved that day you ministered to her and we're sharing a story from Second Kings, which we'll share with the listener today. But God has truth. There's truth in his word for every situation that we're going through. Um, Another night, lately, we heard from an Afghan friend. They said, we have Bibles. They had Bibles in their home, and the Taliban were on their street and were looking door to door in the houses, trying to find different things, money or Christian materials or different things. And so we know that it's truly, right now in Afghanistan, it's people feel surrounded. Christians in Afghanistan feel extremely outnumbered, but God has a word for them and we want to encourage them mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. And for the listener, um, I pray that you don't feel like your life is in jeopardy right now. And usually that's not what it is. It's usually that we feel overwhelmed by financial pressure or social pressure, or the government is not, uh, 
performing the way we think it should or whatever those things are. And and those situations can feel overwhelming to us as well. Mm -hmm. And so whatever your situation, today we're going to talk about what you can do as a person who's called to be a difference maker. Um, But I really want you to think about, as we're talking, begin to ask the Lord to show to you the areas of your life where you've almost had a a sense of panic. Mm -hmm. If it's hard to catch your breath when you're thinking about a situation, it may be a time for you to get God's perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And so I want to share from 2 Kings chapter 6 today this amazing story. Uh, We love um, the Word of God. His Word brings truth and life. It cuts between body and spirit. It helps us discern what's of God and what's something that needs to go away in our life, you know? And so there's a scripture in 2 Corinthians that says, bring every thought captive. Um, And especially those things that exalt themselves against God's word or his wisdom or his peace, that we're called to cast those things down. One man said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. You know? <laughs> and so you just think about if you're having thoughts or feelings or dealing with anxieties, a lot of the times those thoughts or those images or news things that you're hearing when you're driving to and from work or situations that you're in, say you're in Afghanistan, you can't pre- prevent or control those things, but you can control allowing them to stay in your thought, stay in, in, and set up residence inside of your heart because those things begin to, to develop a root system and steal our joy and steal our peace. And they want to choke out the word of God that brings peace and truth and life. And they want to bring in shadows of darkness or fear or despair or hopelessness. And we know that God is a God of hope and truth and life and that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So I want to share this scripture today because I think it's a very timely scripture. Verse 13 of 2 Kings chapter 6 says, The king spoke to his servants. This is the king that wants to kill Elisha. He says, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. There are people looking for him. They're searching for him. They want to capture him. And they don't want to capture him so they can take him and have a nice dinner. They want to capture him so they can kill him. And this is what our Afghan friends are dealing with right now. So they found him in a city called Dothan. So verse 14 says, So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night, and they surrounded the city. You know, that's how the enemy comes in. He never comes openly. He's a coward. And he'll come in the darkness of night. He'll come into those dark places of your life. He'll come into the places where you're not fully sure. And that's where he'll try to surround you. Mm -hmm. And he surrounded them. And when the servant of Elisha, this is like his personal assistant. And this is a man that knew him well. It says, when he rose up early in the morning, he went out and behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? He is freaking out. They're surrounded by chariots and horses. Now, these are prophets. These are not like captains. They don't have tanks and jeeps. So he's like, we're going to die. What do we do? And Elisha says, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if I'm Elisha's servant right now, I'm like, Elisha, what did you drink for breakfast? You're not on point right now. Man, we're surrounded by chariots. There's a few of us in a tent down here in this valley. We're surrounded by men of war and chariots and horses. And Elisha, he's calm. And he says, don't worry, brother. There's more people with us than against us. And now this guy's looking around and he's saying, no, there's not. You know, and so, and and that's how we feel sometimes, right? We feel outnumbered. But Then Elisha prays and he says, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Mm -hmm. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now what they thought was that they were surrounded. 
But when the eyes of their understanding were opened, they realized we are surrounded. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by a heavenly host. We're surrounded by the peace of God. We're surrounded by his power. We're surrounded by his angelic army that fights our battles for us. And so, you know, that's the reality is, is, is that just because you see it, in fact, we dealt with this with my dad who was diagnosed with a lung disease. And we're saying, okay, what we have to weigh are what are the facts and then what is the truth? And the facts and the truth won't always line up with each other, right? The facts were there's an army surrounding Elisha and his servant and they want to kill him. The truth was there's greater, there's more with us than against us. So Elisha prays and his servant's eyes are opened. And guess what happens, man? These guys that have surrounded them, they lose the battle. Elisha and his, and his servant, they take control of the people. And, and, and then the king of Judah's army, they say, should we go? They come to Elisha. They say, should we go and kill these men? He says, no. In fact, I want you to do the exact opposite. I want to redeem them. And that's how God works. So Elisha gives uh, these kings instructions, take the men while they're blinded. So the God, the Lord causes these men that were going to attack and kill Elisha. He causes them to be blinded. And then they lead them to a, a distant area called Shechem or Samaria. And he says, and then when they get there, the Lord gives them their sight back. And the king says, do we kill them all? He says, no, don't kill them. I want you to feed them. And I want you to send them home. And so, you know, how the kingdom of God works, it'll almost always contradict the way that our carnal mind will think. And the, the Bible says that the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. But in the middle of any scenario, if you're an Afghan being surrounded by the Taliban, trying to get out of the country right now, listen, we want to help you. And we're trying to help you. But whatever your scenario, I want you to, to be encouraged. You may feel surrounded. You may feel outnumbered. But greater are those that are with you yes. than those that are against you in every scenario. And so God is ready to give you victory in the middle of this battle. Mm -hmm. Jesus and his disciples were in a boat. There's waves crashing. There's a great storm. The Greek word in this storm is seismos. We always think of wind and waves. It's an earthquake. Underneath the Sea of Galilee are two continent, continental plates that meet each other. It's called the Rift Valley. So there's two continental plates that meet right underneath the Sea of Galilee. So what the Bible says is there's an earthquake underneath this little lake. The Sea of Galilee is being shaken by an earthquake. And Jesus and his men are in a little boat out in the middle of this earthquake-riddled lake. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is asleep. And the disciples come to him and say, Lord, wake up. We're going to die here. And he says one thing. He wakes up and he goes out and he sees the waves in the water. And he says, peace. And the waves stop. And the men say, who is this? Man, that he commands the wind and the waves with the power of his word. And that's the power of God's word is that he has authority in every situation. Yes. If it's an earthquake, if it's a king and an army surrounding you, listen, he knew it all beforehand and his authority and his power in the middle of this situation are capable. Yes. And greater are those that are with you than against you. Yes. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is giving us the secret of his kingdom. He's preaching this amazing sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, I want you to bless those who persecute you. Pray for your enemy. He's giving us a secret to his kingdom. He says, when we bless those people who mean us harm, that it's like heaping coal, buckets of burning coals on their head. They can't stand it. And the world wants you to be afraid. The enemy wants you to tremble, tremble, shrink back in fear, run in terror, go into a season or a state of calamity and confusion and panic. But when we stand on the truth of God's word and we look and we say, Lord, open my eyes to see things the way that you see them. Then he gives us eyes to see angelic warriors with flaming swords of fire. He, he allows us to be 
to have heavenly camouflage where the enemy no longer can see us or access us. We can prance into the the courtrooms of kings and princes of this world, and we can have wisdom and dominion and influence and victory. That's what we're called to walk in, church. And if you feel outnumbered today, listen, my prayer is the Ephesians 118 prayer. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that God would open your eyes to see things the way he sees them. Ephesians says that we're seated together with him in heavenly places. And and we have to zoom out sometimes and not look at our street view, not look at the things the way that we see when we wake up, but let's look from God's heavenly perspective, remembering that he has all authority in, in heaven and in earth. And so, yeah, so that, that story is just such a powerful story. I love that you just talked about blessed, pray for those who persecute you. Because not obviously that applies to the Taliban. We're needing to pray for those that are persecuting Christians. And that's, it's one thing for us to do it here all the way on the other side of the world, but it's something different when Taliban are on your street. And But God's still saying, I'm calling you to pray for those that persecute you. But I think here, if you're not in Afghanistan, just people who are dealing with anxiety, a lot of times it comes because there's someone that's done you wrong or you feel the government's against you or this group of people are against you or there's something that's affecting you. And the Bible says to pray for those that persecute you. And that's one of the ways to get rid of anxiety. It seems so, doesn't make any sense at all, but God is saying, if there is anxiety caused by a person, begin praying for that person that's caused you harm. And that's one of the hardest things to do just because it doesn't flow from our lips, but he's asking us to do that. Mm -hmm. And then I love the second king story. It's a picture of Jesus because Jesus, he's the one that removes the veil. Second Corinthians 3.16 talks about a veil that's blinded those that don't believe. But when the veil is lifted, like, This is so exciting that Jesus can remove the veil. And this is what's happening with Elisha's servant. It's like he's veiled. He doesn't see spiritual things. He wakes up in the morning and he's panicked because he sees just everything that's coming at him, everything that's around him, everything, everyone that's surrounding him. And then Elisha, he doesn't just say, like, servant, open your eyes. Look at this. He prays. It's that little thing, that little word we could miss, but Elisha says to the Lord, he's praying. He's saying, Lord, open his eyes. It's not, he didn't get on his floor and having this like hour long prayer meeting. He's just talking with God. That's what prayer is. It's simple, communing with God, Lord, open his eyes and bam, like then he can see that more are with them, that they are surrounded by heavenly forces and heavenly warriors that are battling for them. And that's our job as believers for our Afghan friends, that we pray, that we're praying, God, open their eyes, help them to experience your presence. Let them see that even though they feel outnumbered and that danger's all around them, that they are surrounded by your army. Angel armies are encamped around them. And so we must do what we're called to do, which is pray. Pray for their eyes to be opened and their eyes will be opened and they will begin to see. And they will, when they see that, they can, the peace of God comes in the midst of the storm, like you talk about. So it's such an amazing, important story. The word of God is so applicable through all the ages for everything that we go through. There's something in the word, and this is perfect for this situation that we're going through now. You know, on the idea of Elisha and his servant, and you're talking about that simple thing, that one little key thing that happened was prayer. Mm-hmm. And and you think about Elisha's servant. This was maybe the first time he had encountered being surrounded. And so Elisha, he hears Elisha pray. I mean, he says, we're surrounded. Elisha's like, no, we're not. There's more than with us than against us. Now, Elisha knew that, but that he had been discipled by a prophet named Elijah. Mm -hmm. And so he had seen Elijah react this way before. So he was taught. So now Elisha lives in this reality. He doesn't need someone else to pray for him every time he's surrounded by Mm -hmm. in or in a negative circumstance. He's not like, pray for me. I'm desperate. He's like standing in this reality now. And I think that's very important because... We can live in this reality like Elisha lived, where 
he no longer was concerned in the middle of that scenario. He knew his position with the Lord. And I think that that's what we're called to do as difference makers. We may feel surrounded right now, but I believe that even with this podcast, that the Lord is helping you, that the Lord is opening your eyes to for you to see the way that he sees it, to realize that greater are those that are with you than those that are against you. Mm-hmm. And so, all right, well, Bevan, you have shared a story many times about David Livingston, and I think this is such a great story about um, the power of prayer and the truth of supernatural you know, we have dominion and uh, supernatural dominion, but can you share that story about Livingston? Yes. David Livingstone, he was a famous missionary to Africa. And so there's a story that he tells, one of a very powerful testimony that when he, around the time when he had first arrived, he heard that there was warlike tribes surrounding him. And they had said that they were going to come that night to their camp and kill him and his team which his team was a small team, but they had heard this. And so, of course, they're terrified. And it wasn't, you know, they couldn't just hop on a plane and leave the situation. They were in a location and they couldn't leave. And so they set up camp and they're in their room that night. And there's a journal entry I want to read. This is from David Livingstone from January 14th, 1856. His journal entry read, and people say that have read this journal entry that you could tell there was like a shakiness in his handwriting. And he says, it's evening. I feel much turmoil and fear in the prospect of having all my plans knocked on the head by savages who are just now outside the camp. But Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. This is the word of a gentleman of most strict and sacred honor. So now... That's the end of my fear. I feel quiet and calm now. And the people who studied this journal entry, they said at that part that you see just his letters even straighten up and the shakiness comes out of his hand. And so that night, that warlike tribe did not attack his camp. And so they were just praising God. You know, they lived. They didn't die. No one attacked their camp. Well, years later, the tribal leader from that camp accepted Jesus. And David Livingstone said to him, do you remember you were going to attack our camp? We had heard that you were coming to attack, and why didn't you attack that night? And the tribal leader said, we did come to attack, but when we did, there was 47 armed soldiers outside of your camp. They were so big and huge, and we didn't want to attack because we would have been killed. Well, David Livingstone is confused, thankful, but thinking we had no guards outside of our camp. But he knew it was God. He knew that it was, you know, spiritual warfare for him. Well, then he's he's back in Scotland on furlough, and he's sharing this powerful testimony with the people. And he, he talked about how the, the tribe didn't come and attack him. And at the end of that, this man came up to him and he said, was it 1856, January the 18th or whatever the date was? And David Livingstone said, yes. And, and the man said, well, that night you said that the, they saw 47 warriors outside your camp. That night we've logged all of us who came and were interceding for you. And there was 47 of us praying. And it's just the power of prayer. And so as these guys are praying in Scotland for a missionary all the way in Africa, God is moving on their behalf. And these warlike tribes are seeing 47 warriors, angel warriors standing outside the camp. And so I just hope and pray that you would understand the power of your prayers, that they're not just words thrown up to God. They are powerful. They're arrows. They're arrows going into the enemy, into the enemy's territory. And also that just like we've been talking about, that we would have eyes to see spiritual things. Because I love how you said that. Yeah, his servant probably from then on, and they certainly encountered other things in their life together, he would have spiritual eyes to see. Or he could say, open my eyes because I've seen it before. I've seen before that I'm surrounded by you. And so open my eyes again. And that's my desire that our listener and that me and you, that we will have that same heart and that same, just we're that resolute that when we feel anxiety and when we feel surrounded and when we feel overwhelmed and when we feel we can't face this situation back home, that we would say, open my eyes to see, give me heavenly perspective, help me to know that I am not 
overcome by what I'm seeing around me, that I am surrounded by heaven's armies that fight for me, that battle for me, and that we would walk in that power of knowing that. You walk different. If it's me walking into a room and I know I have angel armies going behind me, I'm going to be standing a little taller. Mm -hmm. And why do we not have that perspective every day of our life? Because that's the truth. We are surrounded by heavenly armies. Yes. So... I love that story. I pray that it encourage it encourages me. I just the power of prayer, and I hope that it encourages our listener. Yeah, it is. Well, you talk about we're talking about feeling outnumbered and aims. What we do is we work with unreached people groups, and our goal is to see people who are unreached with the gospel know Jesus. And there's a number, a two percent. Will you explain about the two percent? minority and explain feeling outnumbered as the 2%, what sure. that's all about? Yeah. 2% is a majority. So, you know, everything that we do at AIMS is to target and reach unreached people groups. So if you go to our website, you're going to see that you can adopt a people group. And what that means is you're partnering to reach an unreached nation with the gospel. So these are people that have no church, no Bible, no access to a Christian, Without your partnership, without sending a, a missionary um, or a gospel messenger, they may never hear the gospel. And every day over 50,000 people die, and they've never even heard the name Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we want to change that, right? Yes. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, he said, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Now go and make disciples of all nations. So how do we get a nation to be discipled? What does a discipled nation look like? What we are after is 2%, 2% evangelical Christians among an unreached nation. Statistically and historically, that's all you need it's like the to see point. a generational movement begin. And so I want you to think of being even a 2% majority. And that's the power. You know, Jesus said in uh, Matthew, I believe it's chapter 13, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Now, he refers to yeast in scripture also as like sin because yeast is so powerful. He says a little bit of sin in your life can ruin everything. But he says about the kingdom, he said the kingdom is like yeast as well. You can have a pile of flour, sugar, eggs, salt, whatever else you need to make bread. But if you put just a little bit of yeast it says it will leaven the whole lump of dough. What that means is it's going to make it from being flat to make it nice, puffy, big, tasty bread. And so that's the power of a 2% majority. You might be the smallest ingredient in the batch, but you have the greatest impact. So when it comes to aims and what we're doing, 2% of people accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord saying, we believe in him. Not only that, but we're going to raise our families to, to know him, to know his word and believe in him, to pray, to meet together, to, to be the church and congregate and worship and uh, honor you know, the Lord through sacraments, through baptism and evangelism and discipleship and teaching and ministering to each other and caring for the broken, the lost, the widow, the orphan around us. That when just 2% of the population says that's how we're going to live our lives, it can p permeate the entire people group, the entire nation, the entire country, the entire government, your entire workplace, a 2% majority. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. Listen, we don't have to be the status quo to do what God's calling us to do. All we have to do is say, Jesus, you and me is greater than anything I can face in the world. Uh, the word says that Christ in us is the hope of glory. All of a sudden, when our little lives are dead to sin and alive in Christ, he puts the power of his kingdom inside of us and we become difference makers. No matter what the odds, his kingdom can come through our lives on earth as it is in heaven. But now I want to get with you, the listener, I want this to become very personal and very practical, okay? In your life, you may feel surrounded or outnumbered. Or you may be dealing with people. Maybe you have friends in Afghanistan that feel outnumbered or surrounded. But we're going to talk about how this can become very practical. And remember that we have a discussion guide. You can download, go to aims.org slash podcast, 
and you can download this discussion guide and it'll help you kind of um, flesh out these thoughts that you're having and this process. So Bevan, can you help us and walk us through these practical steps? Yes. So these are the practical. The first thing, in what ways have you felt outnumbered or surrounded? And we'd like you to write that down. As Josh said, we can we have a discussion guide, aims.org slash podcast. You can download our discussion guide and you can write. There's lines. You can also take a team, take a group, a Bible study through this. But in what ways have you felt outnumbered or surrounded? Write that down. Number two, ask God to open your eyes to see from his perspective. This is what we've been talking about from this story. But what would happen if God would give you in a moment his perspective? So ask God to do that. That's the second practical. The third practical, who are others in the world who feel surrounded? And this is your opportunity to begin praying for others. You can write down a prayer for them, or you can just spend some time in prayer, but pray for others who feel surrounded. Obviously, pray for believers in Afghanistan. Pray for non-believers in Afghanistan. Pray for the Taliban. And remember that David Livingstone story. So those are three practical that we believe if you'll do them, it will change your life. So we really hope that today this episode has helped you if you feel surrounded or outnumbered. Remember, God is calling you to be a kingdom difference maker. And no matter your scenario, we know that he's going to open your eyes to show you what he's doing in the middle of any situation that you're facing. Also, that you're going to be used like Elisha to pray for and see the eyes of those around you opened up so that they can see the truth of what God is doing in their situation. Remember to like and subscribe to this podcast, share it with your friends, and go to the aims.org slash podcast website page so that you can download the discussion guide. And remember, Bevan, what do we always tell our listeners? We can impact nations one relationship at a time. So you guys know what you call it when you're surrounded by a herd of sheep? A lamb bush. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the aims.org podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it on social media. Also, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's connect on Facebook and Instagram at aims.missions or through our website at aims.org. If you would like to financially partner with Ames in reaching unreached people groups with the gospel, go to aims.org slash give. Do you want to make this personal? Download the discussion guide from today's episode at aims.org slash podcast. Thank you for joining the community of Difference Makers.